The strategy is to go to where our members are and do an intimate conference that dives deep into a very pertinent topic that they're all thinking about strategically. So it has a very strategic focus and that is the draw. So the topic in the fall is multiomics. We just did oncology in the spring. We did artificial intelligence last fall. Things that are top of mind that they're trying to navigate, bring them together. You like to have no more than 150 executives together because they're in one room the whole time. It's just one general session, no breakouts. There's no sponsors, there's no exhibitors, there's no press, there's no analysts. There's nobody who's trying to get their time except the network of their peers and colleagues. So it's a very safe space for them to have strategic conversations, look at partnership opportunities, things of that nature. And that's the only place you can get that. This is Associations Thrive, the podcast celebrating successful associations and their leaders. I'm your host, Joanna Pineda, CEO and Chief Troublemaker at Matrix Group International. Listen in as top association executives tell all, revealing the creative and innovative ways they're increasing membership, generating revenue, nurturing engagement, and reimagining their organizations. By the way, if you've launched a new initiative, created new member services, or updated your governance structure and are seeing great results, I want to hear your story and so do my listeners. I'd love to have you as a guest. Go to podcast.matrixgroup.net and apply to be on Associations Thrive. Now let's dive into this week's show. Today, I'm speaking with Mike Copps, President and CEO of the Analytical Life Science and Diagnostics Association, or ALDA. Mike, welcome to the show. Hello, Joanna. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Mike, tell us about ALDA. Yeah, absolutely. So ALDA has been around for about 30 years. My predecessor was the only prior CEO of this association. It's had various names and iterations, but throughout that time, it still kind of kept its core essence. And that is our member companies and the executives of those member companies who are members Our member companies are heavily involved in research, drug development, quality assurance, quality control in the healthcare system. So anytime you're hearing about drug discovery or research taking place, scientific research, their tools are being used kind of behind the scenes on the analytical instrumentation side, life science tools side, and then the diagnostics side as well. So for the analytical instrumentation that is used to analyze chemical and biological properties of substances, really. And there's various industrial and research and quality control applications for those. The life science tools are companies in the the gene sequencing, DNA sequencing tools that you hear about as well, cell analysis, bioinformatics. And then the diagnostics companies are, you know, like their diagnostics, clinical diagnostics that are also used. So some of our companies are very large companies that have dip their toes in each of those realms. Ah. Some are focused on specific categories and some are small pre-product, pre-revenue companies that are doing really exciting things in some of these areas and categories and leveraging artificial intelligence and some of the other buzzwords that you're hearing out there right now. So we run the gamut from large publicly traded companies to the smaller companies and across those three primary areas. Mike, there are a lot of associations in the healthcare space, pharma associations, R&D organizations, healthcare associations. Why these three areas, analytical life science and diagnostics, so that you're all done? Like what ties these three, I guess, aspects of healthcare together so that your members are part of ALDA? Yeah, that's kind of the evolutionary story of the association as well. So we started one of those previous iterations of ALDA was focused just on the analytical instrumentation piece of it. So those companies were the only real members of the association as we got started. And then in the 2000s, as gene sequencing, DNA sequencers, companies like Illumina came to be in there, a major company within our industry, our association, and their CEO is actually the chairman of the association right now. As they came to be, those types of systems, those life science tool systems 
the facilitator research and development in biology and medicine started to become a part of the association as well. So we added the life science tools piece of it. So it was analytical life science association. And then all these companies started getting engaged in the diagnostics piece. So it was only about 14 years ago that the diagnostics, the D in ALDA was added because some of these companies started adding that component to what they were doing as well, the molecular and clinical diagnostics. So you can kind of follow the letters through the acronym to trace the evolutionary path of what the association is, and that ties them all together. So it was really the members who were evolving, which then encouraged the association to also change its focus and create a bigger tent, if you will. Yeah, and the members are evolving and the customers are evolving as far as what they're testing, what they can test, how sophisticated they're getting in research and development, and what tools they need in order to succeed. So, you know, that's what our members do is provide those tools for those research organizations and pharma companies, biotech companies to succeed. So as they evolve and as they need more intricate, specified tools, our members evolve to provide them. Wow. So you're a trade association and with trade associations, obviously the members are companies. So who within these companies are involved with Alda? We're really focused on the senior executives. So if you look at our board of directors, it's primarily CEOs of these companies. And if you come to our conferences and you look at our membership directory, it's the same thing. The primary contacts typically is CEO. We do have some larger companies where senior execs or others in the C-suite may be the primary contact and may be more involved than the CEO is. But by and large, it's the chief executive officer who becomes engaged with the association. All right. Well, we had a lot to talk about when it comes to Alda because you're thriving as an association. But before we do that, let's talk about your journey. So how do you get to become CEO of Alda? So I've been engaged in associations pretty much my entire career, and we're headquartered in Alexandria. I was born and raised in Alexandria. My dad was a federal employee, and in between stints with various administrations, he worked for trade associations, so I knew the industry and the field probably more than others do. One of the few. Yeah. I fell backwards into it a little bit, but not fully. I I knew where I was falling, at least. So out of my undergrad, I started at National Association of Chain Drug Stores in the communications department. I put putting my English degree to good use, got a feel for the industry there, moved on to the Community Associations Institute and decided I wanted to go to business school. So I went to GW to get my MBA and started working at Smith Buckland about now 15 years ago, which is the largest association management company. So those were my three roles prior to Alda. And I knew when I went to get my MBA that I wanted to stay in this space and become an executive and lead an association. So Smith Buckland gave me the opportunity to do that. I ran a couple associations while I was there, some in the healthcare space and one in the hospitality space, which was the last one that I ran. And while I was there, this opportunity popped up. I love healthcare. I love the healthcare supply chain and was very interested when I heard about this opportunity and in late 2019 started the process of meeting with the search committee and learning more about Alda. And it really hit everything I was looking for with my next role. After a series of interviews, fortunately, they brought me on to start in March of 2020. Oh my God. That's how I got here. Yeah. Mike, when you're at an association management company, you sometimes wear several hats, right? Because you might run a couple of associations, but you also have a lot of support because you've got shared IT, you've got, you know, maybe shared meeting planners, et cetera. So what's it like to go from a Smith Buckland, big company with lots of resources, to Alda, where you're in charge of everything? Yeah, it's a big shift. So, you know, Smith Buckland, when I was there, had about 700 employees. Oh, my God. And the association that I was running, we had 23 people on the team. They weren't all 100% dedicated to the association, but I still had a team of 23 people to manage, basically. On top of corporate engagements and responsibilities with you know the management team there. But now when I came to Alda, there's only four of us. And we outsource some of those, like the IT you were just talking about and accounting and things of that nature. Our full-time staff doesn't do that. We outsource it. So it's much different 
not having all of that infrastructure under one roof and having like a network of other executives just down the hall from me or in the office next to me to tap into and talk to about strategy and ideas and kind of the collective brain trust there. Mm. So very different, very different shift. But the piece of it that is very nice is the control over every aspect of the association and, you know, not needing to fit into certain parameters, but really having flexibility with everything from our association management system, as you as you're well aware, to those companies that we outsource with and contract with. And I want to find the best, most efficient partners for running the association. It's very simple. The world is our oyster and we do that. So we're I mean, still in process of streamlining everything. And I guess you always are. Absolutely. There's never a point you get to where everything's just fluid and perfect, but um, we get to continually work on that. And that's very nice. So the independence and freedom is great. Mike, you started in March 2020. At the start of the pandemic, what was that like? Oh, my. That was something I never anticipated, that's for sure. Hard to look back on it a little bit, right? And think, wow, what have we gone through? It is because... You know, our value proposition is really built on our in-person events and our networking. That's really our competitive advantage. And that was gone (sighs) for a solid 18 months. So, you know, I was supposed to come in and go on this member listening tour and go meet with all our board members and tour their companies. And then we're going to have a conference four weeks later. I was going to get to meet everybody. And that just totally disappeared. This is also an association that had never hosted a webinar, didn't have a Zoom account. You know, there was no virtual presence for them, really. Wow. So really, my first day was setting up a Zoom account, (laughs) setting up all these virtual meetings, and then really pivoting as fast as humanly possible. And I had the benefit of having an incredible chairman when I stepped into this, who was really invested in the success of the association and my success, and very committed to it and very very helpful and had great ideas. And one of those was, you know, these are CEOs running their companies and their teams were struggling, their HR teams, their operations teams, and their executives within their companies, because they didn't have their network to turn to as far as what are we all going to do about all of this insanity going on. So we put together these collaborative groups. My first week, we hosted collaboratives for operations executives and HR executives virtually. And we hosted them every week for a year. Wow and let these executives come on. We asked one of them to speak and present on something they were dealing with from the incredible list of things that they were all dealing with to talk about that, open it up for conversation and share tools and resources. So we really shifted the value from this in-person thing to providing a network and just a community of resources. A collaborative was a great word for it because that's exactly what it was, helping everybody kind of navigate this So that's where our value was. And like everybody else, we made our in-person conferences virtual. So we were still able to provide value to the CEOs. We still produced our data, market research and reports, which was, of course, of significant value as well. So we're still able to provide our aspects of our core value proposition. But we added this virtual piece. And now on the other side of the pandemic, for the most part, we host in-person conferences, we're back to that core value proposition, but we supplement those and complement them with these virtual events that we still host for these senior functional executives at their companies. So we have HR, service and support, marketing and sales conferences that we host as well, and just keep that momentum going. And they're very well attended and appreciated. And it's just become a part of who we are now. So that all organically happened out of the craziness, but it was tough to come in. So that's just from the member benefit side of it. From the CEO role, the day-to-day, the engagement with your team. Yeah. I didn't get to spend a single day in the office with my team. When we started, we were were shelter in place, staying at home. So everything just became virtual, all our meetings, all our team meetings. And for the most part, there still are. We meet in person at least quarterly when we can as a full team. Oh, so you're mostly a remote organization. Mostly. That's right. Small portions of the team still get together in the Northern Virginia area, but during the past few years, we added a marketing and communications position to the association that wasn't there. So technically, when I started, there was only three of us, and now there's four, but we hired her with the knowledge that they didn't need to be in the Northern Virginia area. So she's based in Pennsylvania, 
So we don't ask her to come down regularly, but quarterly we do get together as a full team. But I'll get together with the Northern Virginia team a little more frequently than that and see them in the office as well. But yeah, primarily remote now. So that was a big shift. Wow. Well, let's turn to Alda because you know, you're thriving and you're growing. And you say that the core benefits that you have are really these in-person conferences and the market data reports. So let's start with the conferences. If you look at the website, there's a whole calendar of senior executive conferences coming up. It looks like you've got a fall conference and a spring conference and regional conferences. What's the strategy behind those? So the strategy of the senior executive conferences that we host are semi-annual. We always host one in the spring, we host one in the fall. And the strategy has always been our core membership resides in two primary areas in North America and the United States, in particular, the San Francisco Bay Area and the Boston area. It's where biotech lives and thrives. We have a lot of members there. So we'll host one in Boston, which we'll do in the spring, and one in the Bay Area, which is the one in September of 2024. So the strategy is to go to where our members are and do an intimate conference that dives deep into a very pertinent topic that they're all thinking about strategically. So it has a very strategic focus And that is the draw. So the topic in the fall is multiomics. We just did oncology in the spring. We did artificial intelligence last fall. Things that are top of mind that they're trying to navigate, bring them together. We like to have no more than 150 executives together because they're in one room the whole time. Ah. It's just one general session. No breakouts. There's no sponsors. There's no exhibitors. There's no press. There's no analysts. There's nobody who's trying to get their time except the network of their peers and colleagues. So it's a very safe space for them to have strategic conversations, you know, look at partnership opportunities, things of that nature. And that's the only place you can get that is at Alda for the senior executives in this space. So they're pretty special events. Our goal and my main focus is making sure the right people are in the room at each of those events. So we have those core foundational senior executive conferences. And then we complement those with, you mentioned the regional We do regional dinners. So this fall, we're in Half Moon Bay for our conference. We still want to have a presence in Boston. We're going to do a dinner in Boston. In spring, we have our conference in Boston. We still want to have a presence in the Bay Area. We're going to have a dinner in Menlo Park. Ah. Those are just to make sure we constantly have a presence and a venue for these executives to get together and learn and network with each other on an ongoing basis. So we go to where they are geographically. We also go to where they are industry-wise. You mentioned there's lots of associations and industries within this Alda realm. And we go to those conferences. We were just at um, ADLM conference in Chicago yesterday. We go to the SLAS, which is lab automation. We go to cancer research. We go to all these bigger industry events and we host breakfast there and other events for our members to get together and network in those spaces as well. So we like to go where they are, provide this safe space and it's been successful. As you mentioned, we are thriving right now and having the good problem of making sure that we don't get too big. (laughs) You say that these conferences are very focused. How do you pick the topics? How do you know what's at the top of their minds? And how do you do it enough in advance so that you can bring people together and have speakers? The board of directors is key in that entire process. So if you look at the board, the makeup of it right now, it's significant companies in the space that have been around a long time. They're very well respected and they're CEOs and senior executives at these companies. So they really have their finger on the pulse of what's going on. And at the board meetings at these conferences that we host in person, there's always an agenda item to talk about exactly this. So we'll set the topic for the next conference at the previous conference. And then there are companies that are more engaged in some of these topics than others. So I will leverage the board members who are more engaged in that specific area to help identify the right program, the right speakers, the right kind of narrative that we put together. So the board is really, really key in identifying that and putting it all together. You mentioned something else too, which is that you're growing, but there's a challenge there. So what's the challenge? Usually growth is a good thing. Everyone's looking to grow. Everyone's looking to grow. That's right. And, you know, I knew this coming in during the interview process. They said, we're looking to grow, but not exponentially. And we're trying to figure out what the ceiling is. Because these events, 
are so valuable because you have the opportunity, if there's 150 or fewer people, to talk to everyone there that you want to talk to. Or even if you want to talk to everyone there, you probably could get through that <laughs> in a couple of days. Once you get over that, and we got slightly over that at a recent event, and we heard feedback, you know, it's a little busy, doesn't have that intimate, laid back. A little too big. Ah. A little too big. Ah. So we're really shooting for that kind of 150 area of getting the right people in the room. And there's different levers and mechanisms, things that we can do if we need to, you know, cut off registration. So how do you grow but stay 150 for the events? Do you add events? We can add events. We can keep the events that same size and host events in different areas of different continents, which we are exploring. And we can grow by, so you have a certain number of companies that come. So for those 150 people, it's, you know, 80 companies. You could add companies while keeping the same amount of people by having them bring fewer executives to the event. Uh, so you can still grow as a membership base because we're organizational memberships while keeping the event around the same size. Wow. It's just about having the right companies and the right people at those companies in the room. So it's a tricky dance, but we're doing a good job of making it happen right now. I bet that the companies that come want to make sure they secure their spot at the next conference. Because God forbid you say the conference is full. What an interesting problem to have. It is. We've had conversations at the board level about when to do that, but we haven't had to yet. We haven't had to close registration. We did it for a regional dinner one time, but it was like three days before the dinner because it was just too big for the space we had. But um, we haven't had to do it for a conference yet. Uh, okay, let's talk about your market data. So during the prep, you said that you provide a lot of data and research to your members, and some of this data they can only get through you. So tell us about this data. Yeah, so we provide quite a few reports. The main one that everyone has access to is our quarterly market assessment. That, you know, when I talked at the top, I talked about the broad nature of our membership, and this covers a good chunk of that broad membership and various areas at a little higher level based on publicly available information and some proprietary tools that our partner uses to collect that information. But there's also more niche specified reports that we offer for companies engaged in specific areas. So analytical instrumentation bookings reports, things as specific as microplate readers, emerging markets reports. These are areas where we partner with a third party and we have our members submit the data directly to that third party, only participants get the data back and they anonymize and aggregate it. Ah. But it's real time, it's real data that's reflective of the prior quarter that's collected and shared back with those members. So that's not something that they can get elsewhere. A snapshot of what's going on in the industry amongst their core competitors that's accurate. Mike, is the industry growing? Yes, not to the extent that it was during COVID because there was a lot of money coming into research, obviously vaccine development, biotech in general, during that time, lots of funding. And there are lots of IPOs at the time for this space, people were very bullish. And then through various things like overstocking and other things that hindered that the past 18 months or so, China has been a difficult area for our members to navigate. The supply chain was tricky for a little while there for lots of people. The money didn't dry up, but it stopped coming in to the extent that it did. So there's been a fewer IPOs, fewer large funding rounds. Some of the share prices of some of our companies that were rocketing up were starting to flatten out or go down in some instances. So the companies coming into the space and really succeeding has been less than it was during those years. But we're seeing right now, actually, this is we're talking right during a, an earnings period of lots of reports coming out. We're seeing a lot of the rebounding there, seeing lots of orders going back up and more certainty around what's going to be coming in the next year. There had been a lot of uncertainty. Mm. And now there seems to be more interest and more money coming in. And that's going to lead to more product development, more companies getting funding and an exciting time for the industry for sure. So it's a good time to be a part of this industry. And it didn't stop growing. The growth just slowed. And I think the growth is going to pick back up. I think a lot of sectors this happened. Yeah. Yeah. We're not unique. That that narrative I just said, you could probably take all that out and put a lot of different groups in that space. 
Absolutely. You could leave in China and the supply chain and overstocking and all that stuff, and it would be very applicable to other industries. Yeah. Mike, there's a section of your website devoted to diversity and inclusion. What's the DNI challenge in your industry or your association? Yeah. So we started under really looking at this back in 2020, like a lot of groups did. We had a very clear lack of diversity at our in-person events. And we wanted to know how that reflected within the industry. So we did the first benchmarking, DNI benchmarking study of this industry in late 2020, early 2021. And we did a another one this past year as well to see how the needle is moving. But we wanted to see how representative we are of the industry. And we saw that for the female executives in particularly, we had seen some growth in the prior years as far as representation within our membership and at our events, but we were still below what the benchmarking study told us as far as the percentage of executives in our industry that are female. So the board set some very real metrics to reach over the course of our strategic plan that runs through the end of this year. And we've already hit them and moved the needle again because of the success of what we've done. And that's just doing what you have to do, putting some real resources into driving engagement from that audience within the industry, doing women executive dinners separate from our other regional dinners I was talking about, doing receptions for women executives within our conferences, breakfast with breakfast speakers, webinars, things of that nature that you can offer to the executives at our existing companies and to bring in executives from companies who aren't members to get them interested in the association and see the value that we bring to expand that network. So that's been a big success and we're going to continue to drive in that area to meet or exceed the uh, industry benchmarks that are set by that survey. We're going to keep doing the benchmarking survey every couple of years just to make sure that, that we're aligned with that, make sure the needle's moving within the industry and make sure that we can provide tools and resources to our member companies to help them internally yeah. as well to tackle some of the same issues because there's only so much you can do with that, but we're doing the best that we can with the representation at our events. Well, congratulations. It sounds like the things that you're doing are working. They are. Well, let me ask you one more question. During the prep, you said that you are headed to Japan for an international conference that ALDA is sponsoring or hosting. Is that new that you're hosting international conferences? And what's the strategy behind that? It is new. So I mentioned how we've been around for 30 years. And historically, all of our events have been held in North America. In 2022, we held our first international conference ever, and that was in Zurich. We have about 33% of our member companies are actually headquartered in Europe. There's a huge biotech industry there. Obviously, in Switzerland, there is as well. So it made sense to have a conference there. It was very successful. That was kind of dipping our toes in the water. So this past May, we were in London. We hosted an event there that was also successful, and we'll be back in Zurich in 2025. So now we've got this kind of foothold in Europe to meet our member companies where they are over there. And we're going to keep doing that. And part of the strategy is also to go and explore partnerships in other areas and opportunities, which includes Asia Pacific. So you mentioned my Japan trip. I'm very excited. I've never been to Tokyo. We have partnerships with industry associations all over the world. And there's one in Japan in particular, the Japan Analytical Instrument Manufacturers Association, or JIMA. Ah. They actually host this event, not us. We're not hosting it. This is more of an exploratory trip for myself to go meet with executives of our member companies that are there and our non-member companies that are there and talk to them about the value that we could bring, either hosting a reception or a breakfast within the confines of this conference, or certainly exploring the long-term potential of doing our own event over there like we have been doing in Europe too. So there's a lot of interest. We have a great relationship with this group and I'm really excited to see what that brings about, but it's another area of growth for us. Mike, this has been an amazing interview. Thank you so much for sharing everything that you did and congratulations on all the success and have an amazing time in Japan. Thank you so much. Looking forward to it. And thanks again for inviting me. Matrix Max has been a great partner for us, and uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Well, thanks so much for being a client. Thanks for listening to Associations Thrive. 
We're so glad to have you here. You know, my personal mission and the mission of my company, Matrix Group International, is to help associations and nonprofits increase membership, generate revenue, and thrive in the digital space. I want to hear stories of how your organization is thriving in today's challenging landscape. Please apply to be on my show by going to podcast.matrixgroup.net. By the way, do you need help with a digital initiative? Maybe it's a website redesign, a new membership database, or a hybrid meeting that you're planning. I'd love to connect with you. Please visit the Matrix Group website at matrixgroup.net. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode of Associations Thrive. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, leave a five-star rating, post a comment, and share it with your colleagues and friends. Bye.